The grace and mercy and peace to you from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, Merry Christmas! Yeah, I know, Christmas was a week and a half ago. I understand that. But, as we mentioned during our Christmas Eve services, the birth of Jesus, the birth of our Savior, and his entrance into our world to save us is one of two key pivotal events in the history of the world. The other key pivotal event being the Good Friday, Easter Sunday weekend. Now, because of that, we have so many blessings that could be ours. Because of that, we have an enemy who wants nothing more than to destroy us. Enter then our sermon series, a new sermon series for the beginning of the year. The sermon series is called Victory Over the Devil, the Five R's, like the letter R. Victory Over the Devil, the Five R's. Now why in the world would we have a series with that title, especially following Christmas? The answer is very simply this. Christian marked, or, uh, Christmas marked the invasion of the holy into the realms of the unholy. It brought to fulfillment thousands of years of prophecies, and it started the path to Calvary and the empty tomb. This, in turn, means that our enemy, the devil, is angry. He is upset. He wants nothing more than to destroy us, and if we're not careful, our Christmas joy can turn into a New Year defeat. So for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the situation that we're in and how we can respond to it. Now, my goal is this. At the end of each week, it's my goal that we each walk out of the church strengthened in our faith and with fresh ideas and new tactics to employ the victory that's already ours through Jesus. Each week, we'll be looking at another word that starts with the letter R as we are led to realize and live in the victory that Jesus has already won for us. Because you see, our enemy, the devil, is very crafty. God's word says he can disguise himself as an angel of light. And we're going to get back to that in just a minute. What that means is he can make himself look really, really good. And one of the greatest tools he has is to convince Christians that he's not there, he doesn't exist, he's not a threat. He minimizes sin and its effects until even believers are so tangled in it, they find themselves in spiritual bondage. When Christians sin and do not properly deal with that sin, they develop patterns in their lives that are displeasing to God. These patterns are called spiritual bondage or spiritual strongholds. And this is a technical term. This is defined as a mindset impregnated with hopelessness that causes one to accept as unchangeable something they know to be contrary to the will of God. So again, today we're looking at our epistle reading from the book of 2 Corinthians, looking at uh, chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. Now we've talked about the city of Corinth before. We've mentioned Corinth before in previous messages. Corinth was like the Las Vegas of the first century. Very wild living. Very wild living. The Holy Spirit sent the first letter to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians, to help them deal with influences of the world that they had allowed in their church. They allowed the sinful world into their church, and it was impacting the members of the church. That's what 1 Corinthians was all about. 2 Corinthians is a follow-up letter that first addresses the concerns that some people had there about Paul and his visit to them. And that offers a very stern rebuke for those who are actively trying to undermine the Holy Spirit and the teaching he was giving them through the Apostle Paul. So again, our epistle reading, 2 Corinthians 7, 8 to 10. Remember the first, the first letter, 1 first Corinthians, dealt with the sin the people had allowed into their assembly and was very straightforward, very much to the point. Here's our reading. Here's what the Holy Spirit says now in this follow-up letter. Even if I caused you sorrow by my first letter, I do not regret it. Hear what he says there? Even if I caused you sorrow by my first letter, I don't care. God is not interested in your comfort. He's not. He's interested in your character. Even if I caused you sorrow by my first letter, I do not regret it. 
So I, I did regret it. I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I am happy. Not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended. This is the law of the Lord. The law always cuts. It always exposes sin. And it always should always bring godly sorrow for sin. For you became sorrowful as God intended. And so you were not harmed by us in any way. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Into that, the first word that begins with R for this series, repentance. Now, we don't always like hearing that word, do we? We don't always like hearing about the need to repent. We don't like being told that we're wrong. We don't like being told that we're in opposition to the word, will, and working of God. I think that's because we get this verse mixed up. In your bulletins, and your Bibles, if you have it with you today, or go home and maybe do this in your Bibles at home, I invite you to underline, just really pick out some key words here. In this verse, godly sorrow, not worldly sorrow, godly sorrow brings repentance. It's a formula. Godly sorrow brings repentance, that repentance leads to salvation, and we have no regret. Godly sorrow brings repentance, and repentance leads to salvation, and there is no regret. Worldly sorrow brings death. That's actually what we want to talk about this morning here as we start this series. We need to repent. Repent of those things that are in opposition to God that he has very clearly spelled out in his word. Now, of course, you need to be in the word of God to know what those things are. And even if you're not in God's word, that's no excuse. Back me up on this, Art. Ignorance of the law is no excuse, right? There you go. Art is the policeman, by the way. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. So you can't say to God, I didn't know that. Because God's response to you is what? You didn't have a Bible your whole life? You didn't bother cracking it open and reading it? We will be held accountable to God's word, even if we don't know them. We need to repent out of godly sorrow so that our sins will not stand in the way of our salvation and we will not be left with regrets. Now, why start here? This is kind of a downer sermon, Pastor, already. Why start here with this series? Because if the devil can keep us from repenting or keep us from arguing against the things of God, and how many of you right now are arguing in your mind with me? Right now, how many of you are saying, I don't like this I don't like where he's going with this. I don't want to hear this. Understand where those thoughts are coming from. If we, if the devil can keep us doing that, then he keeps us from the victory that we could have over him. You can't have victory over anything if you're still clinging to the very thing you're trying to get victory over. That's a little bit like the alcoholic saying he wants to be free of, of, the, of the hold of alcohol while he's guzzling Jack Daniels. Or the drug addict saying they want to be free of the addiction to drug while they're shooting heroin into their veins at the same time. Or the person who's addicted to porn saying, I want to be free of this addiction while at the same time surfing the web. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. We need to walk away. That's what repentance is. What is it? How do you define it? Again, we've talked about this before. We're not going to beat this to death. Repentance means we turn away from our sin and that we, we, and that we turn to God. Repentance does not mean saying you're sorry. That is not repentance. The word repentance is from the Greek word metanoia. It's from the Hebrew word shuv. The literal definition of repentance is a change of mind which results in a change of lifestyle. That's what repentance means. By the way, what did Jesus say when he first came onto the scene? What were the first words out of his mouth as he started his ministry? Repent. Change your mind, change your lifestyle. Repent. The kingdom of God is near. The first thing Jesus said. This involves agreeing with God that our sins are abominable. Now the good news is what we so often say in our confessions, how we so often, we didn't do it today, but how we so often start our services, what we say from 1 John chapter 1. 
If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confession is simply saying this. This is what confession is. Here are my sins. I'm sorry. That, that's where the sorrow comes in. I'm sorry. Here are my sins, God. Here are the things that I've done, and here are the things that I have not done that you have wanted me to do. The things I've done you don't want me to do, the things I've not done that you do want me to do. Here they are. Forgive me for them. I even ask you to bring to light those things that I don't recognize as sin. Open my eyes and help me to confess and repent of them too. We don't confess our sins to God because he doesn't know what they are. We confess our sins because we need to be honest with ourselves about what we're doing, thinking, or saying that is against God. And more to the point of this series, we confess our sins because once you've named your sin, it's exposed. And once your sins are exposed, they cannot have the same power over you they once did. Once that power is broken, the devil has lost its hold. Repentance following confession, that is the literal turning away from the sin we've named, keeps the devil from being able to worm his way back into our lives. Here's the key to understanding the devil and his plan for your life. And yes, you heard me right. Make no mistake about it. God, God does have a plan for your life, and that plan involves eternal life in heaven with him through the faith given to us by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given to those who believe in Jesus Christ as our own Lord and Savior. But make no mistake, don't be deceived. The devil has a plan for your life too. And the devil's plan for your life is to not believe the word of God and to suffer in hell for an eternity with him. And it's important to understand the key strategy the devil will use to accomplish this. He is not going to come at most of us with scary things, dark occultic images, witchcraft, wicked teachings, things like that, although he does use those. That is why God's word is absolutely clear. There is no black or white here. God's word is clear. His children, Christians, are not to engage and be involved with those kinds of things. Absolutely not. But the enemy's main strategy is to get us to think that our sins aren't going to hurt us. Or even get us to the point where we start denying what is and isn't sin, arguing with God about what is and isn't sin. Or finding loopholes and ways around the truth. He'll get us to do this by rationalizing with ourselves, leading us to think that we have the answers we need. He'll even use people to tell us what we want to hear. He will bring people into our lives, some of whom will think they are serving God, but who will say that we're okay. They say that because they don't know the Word of God. Who are you hanging out with? He will bring people into our lives who will think they are serving God and tell us what he wants them to tell us. Just a few chapters. In fact, the Holy Spirit talks about that. Just a few chapters after our reading today, this is what the Holy Spirit says in chapter 11. For such men, people who do this, are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as the apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Again, the devil can make himself look good, make himself sound very logical. The thing that you and I need, that Christians need, is for us to know what God's Word says. And we can never fully appreciate what God's Word says if we're not in God's Word. And we can never fully appreciate what God's Word says when our own sins remain in the way, in an unrepentant state. Confession and repentance opens our eyes to the truth, even if it's not something we necessarily want to see. Now here's the good news, and here's how we, we the point on which we wrap up this morning. Repentance is the key to beginning our victory over the hold the devil would have on us. And the really good news is this: we can't do it. That's the good news. The good news is we can't repent on our own. That's the good news. God's love for you is so deep that not only is He ready to forgive and forget, He's going to help you. He's going to help me. He's going to provide us with his own Holy Spirit to help us confess and repent. 
to help us to acknowledge our sin and turn away from it and lead a different life if we will let him. If we will let the Holy Spirit have his way with us. Passive acceptance or active rejection. Far too many Christians just simply get it wrong. It is not up to us to do better, to try harder, to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, although we do want to do better, we do want to try harder. But it's not up to us to do those things in order to somehow get right with God, because we can't. That's what a good Friday and Easter Sunday was all about. Thank God, literally, for grace. Because we can't do it on our own, Jesus did it for us. All we have to do, so to speak, is simply receive the gift that's given. Passive acceptance, being made right with God by the receiving of the righteousness of Christ that he wants us to have. The thing we need to get out of the way so we can receive the gift is the sin that clings to us. And if we are honest with ourselves, the sin that we cling to because it feels good, because we like it, because it's comfortable, because to turn away from that sin means that we have to acknowledge that we are not in charge and we cannot determine right and wrong on our own. But God is in charge and he's the one who determines right and wrong. This is what the devil would use to keep us in spiritual bondage, to keep us in a mindset impregnated with hopelessness that causes one to accept as unchangeable something known to be contrary to the will of God. I am not saying we can be sinless. Does anybody hear that? Please understand. I am not saying that we can be sinless. No one can be sinless. There was only one sinless person who ever lived, and that was Jesus. What I'm saying is true confession and repentance. Naming the sin, getting honest, naming the sin, asking to be forgiven and being changed and turn away from the sin loosens the hold the devil has on us and gives us the ability to live the victory Jesus has won for us. So here's the very uncomfortable question this morning. Here's the very uncomfortable thing that we all, and I'm including myself in this, we all need to wrestle with. The thing that we walk out of this holy house with today. What is your sin that clings to you that you need to repent of? What is that thing that keeps you from living fully in the victory? that Jesus would offer to you? What are those spiritual strongholds that need to come crumbling down so you can be set free from them? One last illustration. In the Old Testament, the book of Judges, the Israelites came up against a stronghold called Jericho's Wall. They had been wandering the desert for 40 years. They were ready to go into the promised land, and the first thing they encountered was a stronghold that the enemy put up, Jericho's wall. It was a wall about, about 15 feet thick that surrounded the gift that God wanted to give the Israelites, the destruction of the city of Jericho. Now, they could have said, it's too hard. We'll never be able to, to do this. We'll never be able to get the wall down and defeat the enemy that put the wall up. They could have, but they didn't. Instead, what they did must have seemed ridiculous at the time. Not the first thing, because the first thing they did is what God told them to do. You know what they did the very first thing? They repented. They confessed their sins. They repented. They made themselves clean in front of God. And then they did what must have seemed to be ridiculous to the people around them. They literally, literally marched in circles. They walked around in circles for days until the time appointed by God. At that time then, they raised their voices in a victory yell, and God tore down the walls, tore them down flat, so they could go into the city and claim the gift that God had given them. They didn't care how it looked to be marching around the city. They didn't care about the jeers that probably came at them from the people of the city of Jericho. They only knew something better awaited them, and they trusted God enough to do what he said, to confess to repent and then follow his word. Are we willing to do the same? Are you, am I, willing to do the same? Will we not care what others think of our confession and our repentance? Will we simply, every man, woman, boy, and girl, fall on our knees in godly sorrow 
that brings repentance, that leads to salvation, and leaves no regret. And receive the forgiveness and new life, the victory that God offers us through Jesus. It's free, it's eternal, and it is ours because God said so. Not because anything we've done, but because God said so. So that's the thing for this week. Let's hold on to that this week as we start confessing and repenting and turning to God this week. Seeking God's face and begin to reclaim what the evil one has been trying to take away. Let's start with prayer. Holy Spirit, move in us. Bring us to a place of true confession and repentance. Demolish the strongholds that have been built up in us that we have allowed to be built, and if we're honest, that we have built. Lord Jesus, your birth we just celebrated marked an invasion into a broken, sinful world to redeem broken, sinful people. May we never be comfortable or make excuses about our broken, sinful nature. May we never be comfortable here. May we never be comfortable in our sin. Thank you for the manger that held you, the cross that tried to hold you, and the tomb that couldn't hold you and came up empty on Easter. This is our heritage. We are your people. And you want so much more for us than what we've settled for in the spiritual realm. Take us, change us, lead us to where you want us to go. It's in your name, Jesus. Amen.